The obstacles to hope are large and menacing, yet the goals of a peaceful world today and tomorrow must shape our decisions and inspire our purposes. So we are all idealists. We are all visionaries. Let it not be said of this Atlantic generation that we left ideals and visions to the past, nor purpose and determination to our adversaries. We have come too far. We have sacrificed too much to disdain the future now. And we shall ever remember what Goethe told us, the highest wisdom and the best that mankind ever knew was the realization that he only earns his freedom and existence who daily conquers them anew. Please welcome Tatiana Schlossberg, member of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation Board of Directors and Profile and Courage Award Committee. Thank you all for joining us tonight, both here in the room and at home. Um, the universe fell slightly off balance without a May dinner, so my family and I are grateful that you could all be here to help even things out. Um, we're gathered here tonight to honor my grandfather's legacy by celebrating courage, the quality in public life that he admired most. We have seven outstanding honorees, and their stories are a reminder that fighting for peace and justice is always possible, even in difficult and scary times like our own. As a member of the JFK Library Foundation Board of Directors, I would also like to thank my fellow colleagues on the board and board of advisors whose support tonight and always makes this event possible. Some people, it has been said, need no introduction. Other people, especially at the Kennedy Library, really don't need one. My mother is in that second category, but here I am. <laughs> her work as an author and a custodian of her parents' legacy speaks for itself but I am especially proud of her service as ambassador to Japan for President Obama and as the current ambassador to Australia for President Biden. In both countries, each among our most important allies, she has been a powerful advocate for and example of what America can offer the world at its best. Please welcome Ambassador Caroline Kennedy. Tatiana is so tall. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to be back at the May dinner, and I'm so happy that I could be here in person with all of you, which I wasn't sure was going to be possible, especially at this difficult time for the world. It's wonderful to see so many good friends and old friends and supporters of my father's vision of a more peaceful and just world. I know that there are a lot of other places that each one of you could be tonight, so we're so grateful and honored that you are here at the Kennedy Library. At a time of so much suffering and rising tensions and terrible conflict, we're fortunate to be able to gather to celebrate courageous leadership, which we need more than ever today. One of the great privileges of serving on the Profile and Courage Award Committee is the chance to reflect and think about and discuss all the different kinds of courage. And before I present tonight's awards, I wanted to say how honored we are to have with us someone who embodies pretty much all of them. He's devoted his entire career to serving our country, put his life on the line for our values abroad, and stood up for our Constitution at home. Please join me in saluting former Belmont Hill hockey legend and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, and his wife, Holly Ann. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize another inspiring leader who fought to uphold reproductive rights and so many other of our precious liberties while encouraging all of us to engage in active liberty and citizenship. An honorary son of Massachusetts, or Cambridge anyway, former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Stephen Breyer.
Or just stay standing up, because I have one more. <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the son of Brockton, who has transformed our legal system and brought healing to victims of terrorism and mass shootings, and who made the Profile and Courage Award a nationally prominent event. We're so grateful to our former chairman, Ken Feinberg. Thank you for everything. <laughs> I want to thank Bob Rivers for chairing tonight's dinner and for all you have done and for this personal story that you shared with us um, in your career at Eastern Bank to set a standard of principled corporate leadership, reach out to communities in Boston with your commitment to justice and economic inclusion. And thank you also to Ron Sargent, whose wise and self-effacing leadership has steered the foundation through transitions and triumphs and to who we all owe great depth of gratitude. We are excited to be joined for the first time by the new archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogan, who has spent her career making history accessible to new generations. That is our mission here at the Kennedy Library. And thank you to our leaders here at Columbia Point who work every day to strengthen this public-private partnership. Library Director Alan Price and Foundation Director Rachel Day Floor. And I also want to recognize the Donahue family. Dick Donahue was at my father's side from his first Senate campaign, and the Donahue family was at the been with the JFK family and the JFK Library ever since. I learned uh, at the feet of the Master Dick on the early days of the Profile and Courage Award Committee, and we're always so happy to see you here. We send our love to Nancy and Philip, and are grateful for your support over so many generations. And, and speaking of family, I want to thank my own family for helping make this ceremony so meaningful. My husband, Ed, designed the lantern that is based on the ship's lantern of the USS Constitution and symbolizes the power of courage to shine a light in the darkness. I want to thank my children for showing up for me, for putting their own lives on hold to work for their grandfather's legacy, and for living lives that would make him proud. And speaking of family, I want to thank the rest of my family members who are here but I also want to recognize the family members of the honorees who have come all this way to celebrate and stand with them. Holding elective office is a privilege, but it can also be a burden, and that often falls on those who are the closest. Courageous leadership can be lonely, and your support and love make it possible. I would ask all family members to stand so we can thank you with a round of applause. It's now my great honor to turn to tonight's ceremony. <clears throat> in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, my father profiled eight senators, mostly in the 19th century, who risked their careers to stand up for what is right for America. The Profile and Courage Award was created to celebrate leaders at all levels of government who demonstrate that same courage so that citizens today can still take pride in our democracy and take stands of conscience in their own lives. On rare occasions, we recognize foreign elected officials who demonstrate this same kind of courage. Tonight is one of those occasions. We are honored to present President Yoon of the Republic of Korea and Prime Minister Kishida of Japan with a Profile and Courage Award for working across painful historical issues to bring their countries closer. The relationship between Korea and Japan is one of the most important in the world. Both countries are democracies, the closest allies of the United States, committed to freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. During my time as ambassador to Japan and now to Australia, I've developed a deep appreciation for the courage it takes to advocate for reconciliation and the power of principled leadership to create a better world. 
I learned about my father's pursuit of reconciliation throughout the 1950s when he formed a deep friendship with the Japanese captain who sank PT-109 and his plan to visit Japan in his second term. I saw reconciliation firsthand when I accompanied President Obama to Hiroshima and Prime Minister Abe to Pearl Harbor. Today, we can all be inspired by the work that Prime Minister Kishida and President Yoon have done to overcome serious opposition in their own countries in pursuit of a more peaceful and secure future. It's hard for Americans to appreciate the kind of tensions that stretch back hundreds of years in a faraway part of the world, but these two leaders have put aside the easy path and reached across differences despite strong domestic opposition and upcoming elections to form a relationship of trust. They each became the first leader of their country in 12 years to visit the other country, and they both joined President Biden at Camp David last August to launch a new era in trilateral cooperation that will benefit their own countries and the United States. Their example is one for all world leaders to emulate. Please look at the screen now for some video remarks from President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida. Ambassador Kennedy, board members and staff of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, ladies and gentlemen. When I was a high school student, I studied English with President Kennedy's famous speeches, including his inaugural address and the Berlin Wall speech. Reading through his words, I came to respect John F. Kennedy. The value he stood for and the way he viewed the world gave him the courage and determination to accomplish social progress and scientific advancement. It was the spirit of New Frontier. He showed us that only those with real courage can bring about innovation and reform. His insight was a great lesson to me. I'm honored to receive this year's Profiring Courage Award a symbol of John F. Kennedy's new frontier. But at the same time, I ask myself whether I deserve this award and whether I achieved such an innovation and a positive change. A courage blooms on utter sacrifice and dedication. I once again promised myself to make more efforts I'm even more privileged to take this honor together with my dear friend, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. I know that this award is a reminder of my solemn duty, a profound sense of responsibility placed upon the Republic of Korea, the United States, and Japan to promote freedom and prosperity around the world by standing together in solidarity. To light the path ahead of us, we need to renew our courage with greater dedication. And as we continue to take steps down that road, I will keep counting on your support. Thank you. え、私の親友である 
国際社会が歴史の転換点にある今父君のご尊命そしてその父君が政治のリーダーシップについて書かれた著作の名を冠した名誉ある賞をこうしてユン大統領とともに受賞することを大変光栄に思います1960年代初頭ケネディ大統領と私の高知会の大先輩である池田隼人総理大臣は日米それぞれで今日にも残る大きな業績を挙げそして日米関係の強化においても多大な足跡を残されました1962年に米国を訪問した池田総理にケネディ大統領は「太平洋は日米を分かつものではなくむしろ両者をつなぐものだ」という言葉を送られたそうです。当時は日韓両国が国交正常化に向けて交渉を続けていた時代ですその後1965年に国交正常化を成し遂げた両国は今日に至る約60年の月日の中でそれぞれに重層的な人的交流を通して友情を培い絆を深めてまいりましたそして現在私とユン大統領は日韓関係の強化にかける強い思いを共有していますユン大統領との友情と信頼関係のもと日韓がパートナーとして力を合わせて新しい時代を切り開いていきたいと考えています今日インド太平洋は日米韓そして地域の諸国を分かつのではなくケネディ大統領が述べられた通りお互いを結びつけています日本は同じインド太平洋国家である米国や韓国と緊密に連携し共に地域の平和と安定に貢献していきますケネディ大統領は1963年9月国際社会に向けて行った演説において「平和は協定や規約の中だけにあるものではありません」「すべての人々の心と精神の中にあります」と述べられました。我々政治指導者には人々の絆を平和の礎とし言葉だけでなく行動で今日よりも良い明日を目指していく責務があります私は日本の総理大臣としてバイデン大統領やユン大統領とともにその責務を果たしていく覚悟ですご清聴ありがとうございました We are especially fortunate to have with us、uh, to accept the awards His Excellency Ambassador Cho of Korea and Consul General Kotaro Suzuki of Japan to,、uh, to accept the award, along with、uh, my former colleague and very good friend,、uh, former Vice Minister Takeo Mori of Japan. And it's especially、um, wonderful because、um, Ambassador Cho and Vice Minister Mori worked together to bring. This partnership、uh, into being. And so we're very honored to have both of them here tonight、um, to receive the honor. So if, if the three of you gentlemen could come to the stage, we will present the lanterns to you.
Hello, everyone. I'm Jack. Um, I've been working for my mom for about 30 years. Uh, I just want to thank my parents, first of all. Um, my, my dad does so much for this library. Um, he's designed the museum here. He designed these lanterns. He designed the EMK Institute across the street. He shows up for every meeting. He led the effort to digitize President Kennedy's records. He is the man, and he should get a round of applause. And I have to thank, I have to thank my mom. I think doctors need to study my mom and find out how she does it all. <laughs> she has so much energy. I saw her in Australia. She's been to literally every single part of the country. That's a place with people who have a lot of energy and they can't even believe it. <laughs> so she, she's, we're really lucky to have her serving. Um, and thank you Tat Tatiana who is so great and I'm so lucky to have such a great sister. Um, <laughs> And I want to thank Rachel Floor. Um, the library had a really big year this year. We had President Biden come, we had Prince William come, and most of it was all, pretty much all of it was Rachel's idea and Rachel's doing. And so we really owe Rachel um, a lot of thanks. She's responsible for getting me and my family here and making sure we do a good job, but you can't win them all. So <laughs> thank you, Rachel. President Kennedy, my grandfather, lived a life of public service and of courage. Courage was the quality that he admired most. And he believed that at its best, America was a country that did things, not because they were easy, but because they were hard. Well, tonight, we're celebrating the political courage of five representatives who put the national interest above their own political interests to do what was right. The, sen the sister senators here tonight did not do what was easy. They did what was really hard, but they did it for the people of their state. Senators Sen, Sheely, Matthews, Gustafson, and McLeod represent the only women in the South Carolina State Senate. They're from different political parties. They have different views on the issues of abortion. Some are pro-life, others are pro-choice. I'm gonna get the facts here probably a little bit wrong, but I have two sisters, so I know that the sister senators will have no trouble correcting me for the mistakes that I make. But the story of what they did really deserves to be explained and highlighted. Um, after the, Supreme, the US Supreme Court uh, struck down or overturned Roe v. Wade with the Dobbs decision, it opened the door for states around the country to pass restrictive um, reproductive rights legislation in South Carolina. Uh, rushed in and um, proposed a bill that sought to uh, eliminate abortion after six weeks with few to no exceptions. And the sister senators here tonight, as I said, they're the only women um, in the South Carolina uh, State Senate. Uh, they're from different political parties. Some of them have voted for uh, bills in, in the past that included the same measures that the, um, the legislation in question uh, proposed to do this time. But the way that it was being done, they did not feel was right. They did not feel that um, it was just, it was not fair to the people of their state, to the 51% of their state, the women that, that they represent. So they came together, um, and they came together to filibuster the bill the first time around, uh, and they, they succeeded in blocking it. And a few months later, again, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but a few months later, the issue was taken up by the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court, uh, in an opinion written by the only female justice on that court, um, voted that the law was unconstitutional, that they had uh, tried to stop. But then the South, which is great. But then a few months passed, and the state legislature tried to do it again. Uh, and this time, again, even though they had faced intense political pressures um, and personal attacks, the sister senators came together once again, and they stuck together uh, to try to block the bill from being passed. Uh, but they were defeated when one male senator changed his vote, and the bill passed 22 to 21. And in the months that had passed since the court initially took up the issue, that theme, the only female justice on the Supreme Court retired and was replaced with a male. And then the court retook up the issue again and ruled that the uh, 
the legislation was constitutional and they upheld it. So I think that that shows not that they were ineffective, but that they, what they were up against. Um, and it really shows what it took for them to stick their necks out on this issue at a time when it didn't come with any, um, they didn't get much out of it. It was not a politically convenient thing for them to do, but they did, they did it because it was right. Um, and to me, that is an inspiring story that shows that political courage is not something out of the 1960s. Uh, it's alive today. It's not outdated. Um, so I'm inspired by their example, and I'm grateful for their example. I'm so happy that they and their families are here tonight. And so I want to invite them now on stage to correct me for <laughs> the mistakes I made and to receive the Profile and Courage Award. So thank you. <laughs> I'm honored to receive the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. Thank you, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, and all who selected the South Carolina Sister Senators for this honor. So May 23rd of this year was the last day of session, and we were very close to the final vote. I wasn't leaving the chamber for any reason, except I did for John Parker. He was the one who convinced me to run for the Senate in 2020, and he was the driving force that made this happen when very few people thought the incumbent could be beat. So huddling quietly in a corner while I'm watching, he advised me, he advised me that this decision could be a career ending vote, and I needed to know that. So thank God my reservoir of courage had been accumulating for decades because it certainly was needed right then. See, I've been asked if the abortion debate is the hardest thing I've ever done. Truthfully, no. The toughest times in my life have been punctuated by extreme hardship, financial struggles, I mean, I, I used my wedding ring to pay for rent, you know, twice. Later, I got divorced, became a single working mother, and started life all, all over. And then, in the midst of all of this, my only brother, Troy, was shot and killed. But today's blessings include Todd, 
my husband of 16 years, our children, William, Maggie, and Drew, who's here tonight with us, a gratifying job, a home, and a country I love. To God be the glory for all of that. Each of us, each of us carries scar tissues, scar tissue from life's wounds. So let's build our own supply of courage through time and effort and practice. Moral capital works the same way. And to those who may feel discouraged, I promise you, the more you stand up, step into the arena and take risks, the easier it gets. And when that crucial moment appears, you're ready. We become capable. We become sheroes. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps we even become what my mother always called me, a woman with a heart of gold and brass balls. <laughs> my apologies to you, Ambassador Kennedy. The pressure has been enormous, uh, especially considering the very lives of the babies lost to abortion. But I'll trace, I, I, will, I, will, I will stay true to myself and promise to persist in advocating for, tish, for issues that touch the very heart of every American, especially those in our dear Palmetto State of South Carolina. This award inspires me to inspire others. And it's not just about recognition for me. It is, it is validation of my lifelong effort to do the right thing. President John F. Kennedy captured the essence of courage saying, ask not that the journey be easy, ask instead that it be worth it. And it was, thank you. Okay, she forgot to introduce me. That's okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Sandy Sin. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. And don't count it against my three minutes I was allotted because I have to correct Jack. I am glad. I'm glad that Jack has two sisters. I have five, but or I'm one of five, I guess. But the reality is we were able to hold off absolute abortion ban. We, we held that off. And it wasn't until, yes, thank you. Who, um, thank you. It, it wasn't until the six-week ban that we started getting some erosion, and we ended up, when we lost one of the males, um, who thankfully, a Republican male, who stood with us, when we lost him, two others tumbled. Uh, the reality, though, is if we had had two more women who were reasonable, we would have won, and we would not have had a six-week ban, but we held off a total ban, so for that, I'm thankful. I also need to thank, of course, you gave me three minutes, so thank Boston, thank the Kennedys, thank my wonderful family, a lot of whom are here tonight, I'm so thankful, but I also wanted to thank the United States Supreme Court, and now I see Justice Breyer was here, I had no idea, I was just hoping that somebody might could transfer a piece of my speech to Justice Alito, because, <laughs> please, please do so. I know you've got somebody there, somebody there who's still working there. Um, <laughs> you know, w without their unfortunate decision in Dobbs, no one would have ever heard about the five of us. So thank you, Justice Alito, I guess. <laughs> You know, and I realized he was just writing for the majority, but he wanted to write for the majority. So speaking of him, um, surely he had to blush just a little bit when he actually wrote that abortion was not a sex-based classification. I mean, that will only be true when men can carry babies. He also penned that Dobbs did not eviscerate the equal protection laws, knowing full well that upon re uh, remand, girls from one state would be treated differently than girls from another. In the Bible Belt, where we live, unmarried pregnant girls will be treated harshly. 
How could they not when in South Carolina they are governed by a legislature with only 14.7 percent female representation currently, although we did pick up a sixth senator in a special election last week. So that would be great. Yeah. As Jack mentioned correctly, um, <laughs> that we now have uh, the only state in the nation with an all-male Supreme Court. And everybody worried about Dobbs uh, violating <laughs> stare decisis. I mean, we violated it within six months. We had one Supreme Court rule one thing, the one, another one ruled the other, and the only difference was the makeup of the court. So unlike, though, what Justice um, Alito stated when he wrote for the majority, equal protection is not preserved. It has been upended, and it needs to be fixed. The most important lessons we, well, thank you. <laughs> That's a, okay. Now, now the clapping can't go against me either with my three minutes. <laughs> I'm going to start sounding like a pharmaceutical, you know, disclaimer in a second. Um, <laughs> so, so the most important lesson we can learn from Dobbs, I think, is not to trust a court to keep a law once they are imposed. The Equal Rights Amendment needs to now officially be enacted. It has to be. And by, by the way, none of us felt like, we none of us felt as though we were feminists before all of this. Actually, we were not pro-choice. I think all of us are really pro-life. Um, but it, we have different degrees of opinion on, on what that means. But we did know that, that, you know, we want mothers to have their babies, but it is going to be up to them because only they know their particular circumstance, and we will not judge. <laughs> so we are getting this award for courage, but the truth is anyone who has ever placed their name on a ballot has courage. Yet those who vote in lockstep with their party base, every time they are voting safely, they are not voting with the courage of conviction. They know it, and they do it anyway. Partisans forget that many platforms are set by mere mortals. I believe that my party was wrong in 1976 when, after heavy disagreement um, at the convention, abortion was first placed on the Republican Party platform. And that was over the dissent, by the way, of all 28 female delegates who were there. And it remains a source of malcontent for our party today. Yet my sister senators and I came together really pretty easily on the matter because, like I said, even though we all want mothers to have their baby, so what we had to do was set aside the extremes. Zero abortions with zero exceptions is extreme. Allowing abortions after viability is certainly extreme, but what we did was just cast aside those differences and we tried to focus in what we believe is the reasonable middle. And I believe really that most of us are in the reasonable middle on a lot of things, not just abortion. And we think that maybe why don't we just put it on a ballot and decide? That would be great, wouldn't it? But in our state, that won't happen. I'd like for it to happen nationally. That You see, we can't even get the Equal Rights Amendment ha passed. But we can do it if we all believe it and stick together. Now, during our debates, we were all mad and all frustrated because we knew that it was no dress rehearsal. Carolina girls were going to be impacted. But getting mad does not help. Finding a solution by casting out the extremes will help and electing more women will help. Thank you. I say this without disrespect for good male candidates, and in fact, I long for the day when gender and other suspect classifications don't matter, but today it does matter. And when there is an imbalance of power in any circumstance, it needs to be corrected, because only then will people negotiate and not dominate, and only then will sensible solutions be reached. I have three competitors who say that I'm not Republican enough. Already, we're not even supposed to file until March. But anyway, that's OK. They want a challenge, a challenge they will get. But personally, I think that if you have an elected official that votes with you 80% of the time, you've got a darn good elected official. That's what I think. But I say with conviction that if there is not room for centrist thinking in any party, 
then that party loses and is doomed. And why? Because winning elections is about addition, not subtraction. Because while most Americans do lean somewhat left or somewhat right, they are not extremists. Extremists are here. And you can only fit that many people in the left and the right. The rest of us are more in the reasonable middle. And that's a lot more people. I also say, because Americans want us to govern what needs to be governed, which does not include deeply personal social issues. Because most Americans want to return a polite behavior, even during political disagreements, because manners do matter. Thank you. So we may find a return to civility and love our neighbors more if we heed the words of President John Kennedy, who said, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Thank, thank you. So before I introduce you to my sister, Senator Mia McLeod, I want to say to all of my sisters that if I ever have to be in a political foxhole again, I want it to be with y'all. Senator Mia McLeod. Wow. <laughs> so you see how different we all are already. Thank you. Thank you, God, for this historic moment of global recognition. It is truly the honor of my political life. Ambassador Kennedy, Jack, Tatiana, and members of the Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation, thank you. Thank you, thank you. The love, the warmth, everything that we've been shown just this weekend alone is everything. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing and celebrating my sister senators and me in such a profound and impactful way. My mom, Shirley, a public school teacher and librarian from Burlington, North Carolina. And my dad, Jimmy, a mortician and small business owner from Bennettsville, South Carolina, are celebrating in heaven tonight. They taught me to always do what's right, even if I have to do it alone, and yes, even if I have to do it afraid. President John F. Kennedy said, today the challenge of political courage looms larger than ever before. He was right then, and he's right now. Too many elected leaders choose confusion over clarity, collusion over collaboration, cowardice over courage. And although my sister senators and I do work together often across party lines in a male-dominated, hyper-partisan environment to ensure that South Carolina women and girls are safe, seen, and supported, political courage like ours should be the norm, not the exception. Every day, in every space I'm blessed to occupy, I get to show up as a strong, confident, brave black woman Proud mom to, uh, to my amazing sons, BJ and Cam, who are with me tonight. Small business owner, 
state senator, trailblazer, sickle cell warrior, sexual assault survivor, and unapologetic status quo disruptor. Every day, I get to be pitiful or powerful, victim or victor, knowing that I can't be both. Every day, I'm inspired by my big sister, Tracy, who bravely battled and beat breast cancer, not once, but twice. Yes, every day, in every space, we get to choose. Like truth, courage has become a rarity in politics. None of us do this work for fame or, or fortune, since our base pay for serving in the South Carolina Senate is only $10,400 a year. Bet y'all didn't know that. We fight like hell for South Carolina women and girls because they matter, period. Regardless of how it impacts us politically, we choose to do what's right because it's right. One of the biggest threats to our God-given rights and free will as women and as equals is elected officials who lack the courage to lead. Truth is, Courage isn't summoned in the absence of fear. Courage is what summons us to act in spite of fear. Dr. Maya Angelou said, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. For me, it's not about how many times we get knocked down. It's about how many times we get up. Scripture reminds us that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. President Kennedy said it best, to be courageous requires no exceptional qualifications, no magic formula, no special combination of time, place, or circumstance. It is an opportunity, I would dare say a choice, that is presented to us all. Thank you again for this amazing honor. It is, it means everything to all of us. And now, please welcome my sister senator, Margie Bright Matthews. I first thank God for giving me the purpose, grace, and strength to serve each and every day. For his fearless, unwavering support, I thank my husband, Patrick Fitzgerald Matthews. And yes, his mother named him after a Kennedy. To my four daughters, Jessica, Patrice, Whitney, and Madison, and my grandsons, Brian, Ulysses, Emerson, you are my why. You're my legacy. Thank you for being with me tonight. To my brothers who are here tonight, Herman and Cephas Bright, and your wives, thank you for always encouraging me. To my best friends who are here also, Felicia Rue Howard and Joyce Jones, thank you for keeping me on course. It's been 40 plus years. To my family and staff, I appreciate you and could not do this without your hard work and daily prayers. I accept this award in memory of my parents 
Herbert and Jesse Reen Bright, for they, like Joseph and Rose Kennedy, had nine children, five girls, four boys, who raised us to love God, cherish family, and serve others. I stand in awe as a recipient of the Profiling Courage Award, in awe because I never considered there would be accolades when I started this journey. Because when evil walked into Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, on June 17, 2015, killing then Senator Clemente Pinckney and eight of his church members, I resolved to run for that seat. My then 92-year-old mother was worried about the dangers I would face stepping into politics. Perhaps it was the memory of the pain America felt at the loss of President Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King, and then Robert Kennedy. I persevered because I did not want evil to win. I found the courage. One of my first challenges in the Senate was the access of birth control and reproductive health care for women. Each year, and I mean this, each year that fight has intensified with extreme attacks on the character of women as mothers. At the same time, the care of our children in South Carolina has declined as it relates to welfare, health care, and education. We have to do better. On the issue of abortion rights, health care, each of us has our own story. I think you've heard a little bit of those. But the common thread we found was that we must first take care of the children who have already been born. We know children are the world's most valuable resource and its best help, hope for, future, for our future, but yet we're not taking care of our children. We have to explore common ground on the issues of caring for children along with protecting reproductive rights. The challenge, though, is to do so humanely for the unborn and by not forgetting the abortion tragedies of our past. President Cl Kennedy declared, efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. On this day and at this time and on any issue, I stand ready to continue our civil bipartisan fight for what is right, humane, and in keeping with the basic creeds of our democracy, for I know Civility is not a sign of weakness, but is a sincere effort to reach progress. We cannot afford to allow bitter, mean-spirited politics to be the bully playbook of governing. It has to stop, and it stops with us. The challenge is the willingness to seek and see common ground. We can and must stand not on politics but on principle. No matter the cause, no matter the current impending issue, where will you and your conviction stand? I am deeply honored to receive the Profile and Courage Award. I thank the John F. Kennedy Foundation board members, Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, Jack Schlossberg, Tatiana Schlossberg, Ed Schlossberg, and the entire Schlossberg family for this honor. And now, it is my privilege to introduce Senator Katrina Sheely. Senator, I got a little bit more because she started, she started this train to rolling in South Carolina. Senator Sheely, welcome me to the Senate during my swearing in with a bedazzled pen to signify our sisterhood. The bond of mutual respect 
which transcended party affiliation, began on that day. Neither of us imagined we would be here for an occasion such as this. Senator Sheely, thank you for being a fearless, compassionate, and empathetic leader. I present my sister, Sister Katrina Sheely. Y'all don't know how hard it is to follow everybody. <laughs> On November 22nd, 1963, school was dismissed at Casey Elementary in South Carolina. And all this third grader knew was that pres the president had been killed, President John F. Kennedy. I had a six block walk home and the crossing guards were talking amongst themselves. Some were crying. And for this eight-year-old, it was just something we did not yet understand. I would come home to find my grandparents, who were our caregivers while my parents worked. They were upset. Their heads were in their hand. And their, they were hanging on to every word at the television. We watched every newscast. And I can still close my eyes and recall the somber events of that day and those that followed. Little did I know that 60 years later, I would become part of this story with just the opportunity to stand here on this stage. I want to thank the entire Kennedy family and the Kennedy Foundation for this honor. Receiving a call from Ambassador Caroline and Jack was something most people only dream about. But to be bestowed with this award is a lifetime of history. Now I'm going to tell you, getting five women on a Zoom call at the exact same time to receive the news when you didn't even know what the news was <laughs> about something that, you know, it's going to be life changing. We were thinking maybe it was going to be a trip to the Hamptons or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I got to convince five women, which one is in Alaska, one's in DC, one's in a court case, and one's in Atlanta, and I got to convince them to get on, the t on a Zoom call. Well, the funny part about that was I didn't want to wait. So I, t I just gave them a time. I said, you got to be on the phone at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, I don't care where you are. So that's why I'm the bossy one up here. So <laughs> it's amazing, because I, I told him, I said, Caroline Kennedy wants to talk to y'all. Get on the phone. Maybe she's going to take us to Australia. I don't know. <laughs> Get on the phone. So amazingly, even Mia, who God bless her, she's always late for everything, and we love her, but she was actually early. And we all got on the phone, and we were all so excited. And this has been the biggest honor of our lives. And we've all been dress shopping and everything you could possibly do. And you know, it, it's just the biggest honor ever. I've got to tell you, we we can't. It's once in a lifetime thing. Just like getting them all on the phone call is once in a lifetime. I can never express how grateful I am, or what an honor it is for me and those who helped mold me into the person I am today. So for that, I thank my family. I have a strong, close family with a lot of love and encouragement that has followed me down all these paths. I'm thankful that my daughter could be with me tonight to share this honor. Thank you, Erica. I know that my, thank you. I also know that my husband, who would love to be here but suffers from Alzheimer's, will watch this and be very proud of how far we have come. I came to the South Carolina Senate later in my life, and it was to make a difference, but I wasn't quite sure what that would be. When I fell in the front door, there were no other women. It was just me and my 45 male colleagues. Was it difficult? 
not so much as you would think. It wasn't difficult for, uh, for me as it was for them getting used to having me there. <laughs> but I found my place and it was helping women, it was helping children and veterans. And I st stood strong on all those issues. Not to tell you that there weren't a few ups and downs along the way, but that would be a whole different book to write. Social issues have never been a strong leading part of my political party, unless they were fighting against them. But real people need real issues, and real issues sometimes are social issues. When the issue of a woman's right to make a choice with her doctor for her medical health became a legislative issue, it was time to stand up and tell the legislature to stand down. <laughs> South Carolina has some of the worst maternal health in the country. We are one of the worst states when it comes to providing OBGYNs for our women. We have 46 counties, and 15 of those counties have no OBGYNs. And taking care of children after birth is abysmal. We as women and we as sister senators had to take a stand. Even though we as sisters will probably never agree on how this may end, we did and still believe that women deserve to have the best health care and the right to privacy on, over our own bodies. And on that, we will all agree. <laughs> I am proud to stand here tonight as a strong South Carolina woman and to represent women all across this country who believe that just like men, women should be able to make informed decisions for themselves. I want to thank you again for this honor, and I want to thank all my sister senators for giving me the, the, we'll the tie that will bind us together for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. No, you stay. You stay. We're, we're just wrapping up. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. It has been an inspiring evening. I'd like to offer one more round of applause for all of these years' honorees. So we're looking forward to next year's dinner, which will be back in May. And I hope that everybody here will join us then. Good night, everybody.